This episode of Ragcast Outdoors is brought to you by PK Lures, Bow Spider, and High Mountain Seasonings. Fish on! Hey, Radcast is on! Hunting, fishing, and everything in between. This is Radcast Outdoors. Here are David Merrill and Patrick Edwards. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Radcast Outdoors. This time it's just Patrick Edwards. We're hoping David can join here in a little bit, but he's on the road again. Yeah. That, that's got to be his like theme song. On the but, road again, yes. But you might recognize this voice. I have Shireen with me again. Shireen, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good to be back. I'm glad to uh, be here. It was great last time. We were able to talk about uh, some some hunting last time since I had just uh, harvested my first animal. Uh, this time we get to actually dive into fishing, which we wanted to, to do for so long. So Well, and last uh, time we were kind of going that way, and then it was just like, well, this we happened. just harvested a deer, so we better <laughs> talk about that. And I'm a, an older adult who's learning how to uh, hunt, so that was uh, uh, great. And of course, always learning a lot from from you guys and uh, your your podcast too so thank you oh well thank you yes. yeah while well, you're learning from david anyway, yeah or, or your guests <laughs> yeah or our guests because <laughs> they're pretty awesome yeah yeah we've had some great guests and you're one of those we've thank received you. a lot of compliments about your episode and so it's good to have you back and talk about the thing that you love the most yes fly fishing fly fishing yes and everyone who listens to this knows that's not my favorite way to fish but we're going to talk about we're still friends. Yeah, we're, we're still, still friends. friends. We're and still friends. It's, it's, it's a good way <laughs> to fish, you know, and in sometimes some situations, it's vastly superior to everything else. I've been in that situation. Thank you. Yes, it is. <laughs> but no, sometimes. I mean, sometimes, yes. I mean, if you're harvesting fish, so to keep them, you know, sometimes using gear is a lot more uh, productive or yeah. better too, so... I'm going to share a story with you that's pretty fun. And I know that Seth is going to be listening to this. So I have a buddy. He lives in northern Idaho. He's a good fly fisherman, really good. Catches lots of fish. And I went up to visit him. I think it was in like 2009 or 10. And we went to this lake and it had a whole bunch of bluegills in it. And I'm like, oh, I'll just do the little tiny tube jig, a little piece of worm and the bobber because that catches the crap out of the bluegill. He was catching like five to my one with this bead headed nymph. Nice. He was just flipping it out there and yanking <laughs> bluegill out of the water. I was like, seriously, man, you are killing me right now. But there really are times that fly fishing vastly outperforms everything else. And, you know, it's it's a much more difficult skill to learn than just typical fishing rod and reel, whether you're using a bait caster or spinning rod. And bait casters aren't tough. easy, by the way. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so, I mean, if you've ever used a bait caster and you've had a rat's nest on your hands, uh, which I have a time or two, cause I have actually had one in my hands. Surprise enough. Right. Wow. Um, I know. <laughs> and, uh, it was not easy. And so I think, you know, there's some, yeah, I know shock. Yeah, there's mm-hmm. some skill in all, a lot of aspects of fishing, but in particular fly fishing, you're right. Is just, you know, more primitive in a lot of ways and uh, it can be a lot more difficult and, um, just more, um, uh, uh, in depth when it comes to fishing in general. So, right. So how did you get started in fly fishing? What was the impetus for, I want to try this really hard way of fishing. Right. And I had talked last time on uh, the podcast too, for folks is that I did not grow up hunting or fishing or any of that. I was raised by my grandmother who had to work two jobs to raise me, who didn't do a thing outdoors. Um, she course supported anything that I loved you know or wanted to do later on in life but um, she just didn't you know she was working a lot and so there just wasn't uh, a lot of time to do a lot of outdoors things either or learn the skills of hunting but I always had this uh, yearning of fishing and um, just this really deep passion to, to fish. And I started out gear fishing and then I really wanted to learn how to fly fish. And I worked with some folks that fly fished and uh, there are a couple of old guys and I uh, wanted nothing to do with teaching this young 18 year old girl how to fly fish. Or I, I was 19, 19 at the time nothing to do with it, which I understand because I want nothing to do with that now. <laughs> but, um, uh, and so I had just kind of asked, you know, a, a few times to go and wasn't able to. And then I ended up emceeing because in my job, I do, you know, a lot of hosting of events and a lot of media appearances. And I was hosting the Sportsman's Expo in, uh, in Kalispell, Montana. And uh, I emceed the casting competition and I picked up that fly rod and I decided to 
throw my hat in the ring at the end, kind of just have some fun. And I did really good. And so that fly shop told me, they're like, Hey, you know, for emceeing this casting competition, we want to, you know, maybe set you up with a fly fishing trip or a day, take you out. Took, took them like two years to <laughs> get me out. Um, but we finally did and uh, I was hooked. And so I always highly recommend folks who are learning to get a guide. Um, we have so many great ones in, in the state here in uh, Wyoming in particular, but uh, in really the Northwest region, uh, in, in the Rocky region as well, just so many great guides that that's their livelihood and um, that's what they do for a living. And so uh, they know that water best most of the time. And if you're looking to really get hooked, pun intended, mm -hmm. I always recommend getting a guide. So long story long, I uh, that's how I got <laughs> into uh, fly fishing. And so, um, and I went on the Missouri river for my first time, which is known as the mighty Mo. It's, uh, okay. goes hand in hand with, uh, the green river and best fisheries in, in the country as far as fish per mile. Um, so I've spent a lot of time on the Missouri river and, um, was able to, uh, uh fish there for my fly fish really for my very first time. So what a great place, right? Yeah. It's also a great place to get hooked. A diverse fishery as well. I mean, I, I've had friends that have fished up there. I haven't fished it yet, but I mean, it's got Northern Pike. It's got walleye, sauger, all, yeah. everything. Yeah. So it's a pretty cool fishery. And so what was the first fish you caught? Tell me that story. It was a rainbow trout. And uh, yeah, I couldn't have been more excited, freaked out. And uh, if anybody who's listening has, has fished with me, they know still in my, uh, you know, 10 years plus later, I still get very excited when I catch a fish. And sometimes I eek, you know, uh, <laughs> but at that time it was really like spastic, I would say. Um, and I don't know, it was just some something about it. it was just like instantly I knew that I was meant to do that. Um, there was just no question in my mind. And I didn't really get like headfirst into it until my grandma passed away and I used it as therapy. And then I also met my best friend, John, who owned a fly shop, oddly enough, at the same time, who was also raised by his grandparents. And so we had this connection. He owned a fly shop. I, I mean, it couldn't have what match made in heaven as friends, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so uh, just kind of hanging with him, you know, bought me my first pair of waders for hanging out in the shop and working a bit, you know, him and his grandma and stuff. So it was just uh, uh, really cool to uh, have that connection too. So um, that's really what though, like I just continuously fished, uh, you know, it was a way of therapy. Also had this friend that, you know, was really connected to that could help me out. So um, those two things too, took a little, you know, a couple of years for that to happen, you know, and then I was just kind of like head first in, into it. And that was about eight years ago. That's awesome. Yeah. Fishing is therapy. And we've yeah. had, we've had other guests come on and talk about that, you know, the mental health aspect of fishing. And I found that, you know, reading articles over the years in fishermen and many different publications, but they talk about how therapeutic fly fishing is because you have to concentrate really hard because it's not exactly a natural thing to place a fly, you know, and, and working the line and, and, and doing that. So, you know, I, I used to fly fish a fair amount and it, you it's still do. fun. I bit, still yeah. do a little bit, but you know, it is one of those things where you really have to put your mind into it and talk a, bit, a little bit about that. Cause it is like, it's a lot of concentration. Yeah. It's a lot of concentration and just kind of going back to, you know, if you're dealing with things in your life or, you know, you have a, a real stressful job, maybe, you know, you're a, you know, high executive of some sort, uh, fly fishing is, you know, a really great uh, way to uh, blow off some steam too. Um, instead of maybe going and having a drink or something of that nature, picking up a fly rod instead. And so, um, or, you know, dealing with grief because you have to concentrate, like you said, so much on what you're doing and how you're doing it. And you don't want to get stuck in the trees, <laughs> you know, yeah. you don't want to lose all your flies, you know? So yeah. And then just the rhythm of it, the counting of it is just like, um, you know, it can almost, you know, put you in a soothing uh, state, you know, a trance in a way, because, right. you know, you talk about counting sheep to, to go to sleep. Well, in a way, a lot of times, you know, for people who are learning, you know, you, you want to count a little bit or you're trying to get that, you know, smooth rhythm going and that flow and trying to just be one with the rod and the line. And I think, you know, um, for myself personally, you know, I've used that you know, counting technique or just kind of, you know, motion technique that is just repetitive, that just puts you in this trance and there's nothing mm -hmm. but you and nature. And, uh, that's another great thing about fly fishing. It's getting busy, which 
we could go on and on about. But one of the great things about fly fishing is it's normally taking place in a lot of serene locations, a lot of times anyways. And um, yeah, and then, you know, you're kind of by yourself and, and you have the aspect of being too busy to think about anything else because you're yeah. thinking about how to fly fish because you could fly fish for so many years and just really not get it completely down, yeah. I think. Well, there's so many things to think about. You got to think about where you're going to try to place your cast. You're thinking about where the fish are. You're thinking about what's behind you, what's next to you. I mean, there's just so many factors that you really have to be honed in on what you're doing. And when you do it right and you catch a fish, it's like the best feeling ever because you're like, dang, I just right. pulled that Isn't off. That sweet. I you mimic that exactly how a fly would naturally look in the water, however it was, whether it was at its baby stage of coming out as a, a nymph, whether it was in its, you know, emerging stage as an emerger, uh, it was a, a dry fly on top as it was an adult, or even stripping the streamer, mimicking exactly a minnow or, a, you know, a smaller fish as well. And so, yeah, just kind of that aspect aspect of it I think hooks a lot of folks in the fly fishing right you know that's yeah. that's kind of why you do it yeah exactly and I, I I think that there's just different aspects of it that are valuable to lots of different people like you said it could be the executive it could be you know the wounded warrior it could be anybody a kid mm -hmm. you know um, I think about being a kid and starting with brook trout that was the best thing ever you know catching fish behind rocks I'm like man this is super cool i drop the line in i catch a fish um and your kids fly fish too once in a while right or you haven't gotten into the fly fishing yet. they fish you they know fish. so i mean they're getting but into they it, it and right? yeah like, yeah there is something about going out and targeting a fish mm-hmm Fish are really cool. And right. They're the best. I mean, you and I agree yeah, on this. Yeah. You know? I know. <laughs> if David was here, yeah, we'd have an argument on, which I love too, because I'm learning more about mm. hunting and I uh, just absolutely love wildlife in general. But yeah, there would be an argument there. But our passion is fish. <laughs> That's right. Because I can do it all year. You know, this, oh, year's this year's been, been little, tough. Yeah. Especially for fly fishermen. It's mm -hmm. been a tough year because it's been super cold. And talk about that a little bit. What happens when you're fly fishing in five degrees? I mean, it's it's a challenge on a river. Yeah, and I've been in so many instances fishing in the cold. And this year, by far, has been the worst. And the winter, I've been on the water the least. Um, I'm normally on quite a bit in the winter. And I've only been, I can only count on one hand this winter. I've been on open water in my backyard fishing. Um, so, you know, I went on a trip in November and it was 20 degrees uh, on that trip. Well, we've been having a lot, even, you know, cooler temps than that consistently. Um, but even that was just so difficult. It wasn't productive, just icing up. And it's so much, it's like a, a bead, just a a whole necklace all the way down your line you know it's not even like your eyelets which are normally what get iced up first right. it's like the whole line itself is just collecting this ice so it's just been kind of rough i think a lot of uh fishers in general whether you're gear or or fly are um, looking forward to some <laughs> some warmer temps and some spring and um, hopefully not a huge terrible runoff i know that i'm watching that all over the northwest and the rocky area rockies area just because uh, you know, I have so many friends and that's where I, I spend a lot of my time fishing and you, yeah. you know, you as well, but, um, hopefully not that. So we're hoping for like, you know, a gradual warm up here, but I'll, I'll take a warm up of any sort at this point. Um, one, one thing that I really do like that I think I would highly recommend is a lot of people back at, it's hard to find, but cat crap, it's, it was a chapstick and it was a, a fishing product. Uh, for those of you that are, are listening and you want to comment or something and say, I know what cat crap is. Bring back cat, cat crap. crap. <laughs> um, it, it was also, it came, I think it came, I remember it from the chapstick, but it also came in other stuff, uh, other like, um, uh, bottles or whatever for, I think it was kind of like an ice off paste. Loon use has an actual ice off paste. Gotcha. It actually works really good. It does not work in, you know, below zero temperatures or single digits because at no point really is anything working as I found. Um, but the cat crap chapstick, always seem to work the best. Yeah. Um, you used to be able to find it at a bunch of sporting goods stores and stuff, but uh, it may long be long be gone and forgotten, but I still remember the cat crap, but it was good. So those are a couple of products that I actually recommend using if you are going to be fishing in colder temperatures that I have um, found to be uh, useful. I had never heard of cat crap, well, at least that kind of cat crap. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I learned something new. That's, that's interesting because yeah, like, it is really hard. Even me fishing a spinning rod in those temperatures, 
my eyelids are getting iced and I have to manage that and I can make like four or five casts and then I got to clear ice. I didn't know that. I mean, I wasn't, I I guess I assume, yeah, I guess it is the same, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's brutal and you don't dare fish braid in anything under freezing because it will say that must really clump up, right? Oh, okay. So you'll actually end up with like the worst bird nest of your life on your reel. It's just a total disaster. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've gone twice since the new year on the river doing the river fishing yeah, thing. You had, you had one successful day I saw. I had a couple, yeah. but last year at this time, I'd already caught like 30 fish over 20 inches. This year, I've caught like six. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's been an insane winter, but that's okay. You know, it will warm up and things All over the better. country. And, uh, you know, every single place, you know, I've talked to or I've been has been, I mean, my friends going to Florida around Christmas time. It was freezing mm. there, and so iguanas were falling out of trees. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I just think uh, you know, obviously, we've had this really um, drastic cold spell in the country. So it's going to be a wild spring and summer. I'm forecasting yeah. that for sure in a lot of areas. I think everybody's just going to kind of be like really chomping at the bit to get outdoors. Sure. And when I think of you, I always think of the traveling fly fisher because you like to do not just. Wyoming, Montana, Colorado, you like to get out and about. So talk a little bit about where all you go fly fishing and what you're fly fishing for. Yeah, sure. Um, I uh, just got back from Mexico, but it wasn't a a fishing trip like I would like because some of those are more intense and people don't quite understand how like it's six days of hardcore fishing and, you know, no sightseeing or anything. But this was like a a friend's trip and sightseeing. But we did do I jumped my first tarpon, which was Cool. Amazing. Um, I didn't land it because I didn't bow to the very small. I called him a prince because he was not a big tarpon. So just I didn't bow to the the prince on the the second time he was flying high. But um, I jumped him and got to see him dance. And it was all on video. So that was cool. Um, uh, saw crocodiles out there, which was interesting because I had. Uh, heard they were out there and uh, then you know you're dying of heat you want to jump in the water and all of a sudden the big crocodiles like you know not too far away yeah you change your mind real quick but um, I'm really into saltwater fishing I've enjoyed that quite a bit Um, I think this winter has been rough so it's been so cold I've been thinking a lot about saltwater fishing but yeah I don't think I'll be making it this uh, spring I did Belize last spring so um, I'm trying to look at uh, you know some affordable uh, fly fishing places for salt so the Denver fly fishing show just had um, their big show not too long ago and there were quite a few people there that um, I uh, was able to get some information I wasn't at the actual show but uh, through friends um, that have affordable ways where you're not necessarily you know going to a lodge because some of those are you know three four five grand um, but you could do one or two day fishing too which um, sometimes that's better for some folks too because again like I said when you're locked into six days of just every day non-stop chucking a, a nine ten weight rod fly rod you know all you know half the day anyways because you're sharing the bow of the boat with somebody else it's uh you know sometimes it gets where it's not like an actual vacation it's like we're here to fish like it's a serious fishing trip and i love those um Mm -hmm. but there's also you know more affordable ways to sometimes to do it so i'm looking at some of those things i think like i said at the fly fishing show i heard there were a lot more um instead of the whole like you know five days six nights things you know like one or two or you know here we are you just you find your own lodging and then you get your fly fishing, you know, through some local guides or, or stuff of that nature. So, um, but for other places, I, I want to go to Florida, the Keys, so bad to fish uh, tarpon. They have oh, the yeah. largest migration of tarpon, mm-hmm. I believe, in the world. Um, and so uh, there's a, a female guide down there and I can't remember her name and she's just absolutely amazing. Um, and so I, I've got some friends that I know that are going with her at the end of May. So if they have good luck, I'm hoping I can follow suit and, and go. Um, I've heard they're going to have potentially a bad red tide year. Um, mm. I think they can forecast that now. I've seen some some information on it too. So that will uh, definitely be rough on, on, on that stuff for the summertime. Um, and then uh, getting back to Montana, that's where I've lived for so, so long, but I've stayed away for so, so long um, just because it's gotten so busy. And I'm afraid if I go back, I may not come back <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe sucked back into no, the to the mountain. Back. Yeah, no, I love where. I mean, yeah, I like to keep where I'm at a, a secret because I love it so much. But um, I will go back to Montana. I, I think I'm make, making it to Michigan. 
Uh, I would love to do one of their, they call them steelhead. I'm not sure how people feel. They're like landlocked steelhead, yeah. I believe. Um, and so I, I've got that on my list. Um, uh, Traverse City area in, in the Michigan area or uh, directly across the lake, which takes you like eight hours to drive around. But, um, <laughs> you know, two other, it wasn't just a ferry. There might be, but um, that's on my list. And then where else? Oh, I'm going back to Alaska in September. Oh, cool. So um, I'll be Is doing that. The, that? the end of the silver run right yeah yeah i'll be going for i've done it you know three years i think well i did sitka last year i guess so two years in that area and then i tried to get silvers in in sitka and had some luck but none landed landed but um so yes uh silvers and then i'd like to go for grayling but those are earlier in the year so they really recommend that last week of august first week of september there mm -hmm. um and it's just still a little too busy for me you'll find i try to go to these places when like everything's shut down and it's not the real experience but to me i just you know enjoy you're it a not, little bit more so you're not bumping elbows yeah. with everybody though yeah but everything's closed kind of in home or half the time or if you go to seward half of those things are right. closed so it's definitely hit or miss at that time of year but um i'll do that and uh, hopefully land some big trout yeah i think you can do it Totally. I think I can. Yeah. I've yet to land like a massive trout on the Kenai and I've fished it a lot. I fished it so much that I'm like, I don't even want to, I don't even want to give it any more of my time. Well, the Kenai and the Kisilov both kick out 30 plus inch rainbow trout. I mm -hmm. mean, there's, there's some massive fish in there and you'll get one. I have no doubts, but I do want to ask you about this. So you started, you know, 18, 19 years old. What was it like getting into fly fishing? I mean, what were some of the hurdles, especially as a female? Because we do have female anglers that listen to this show. So what was that like, and how did you kind of push past those? Well, it was a lot different than it is now. Now it's definitely a lot more 50-50 on the water. Getting, I mean, it's not necessarily yet, but a lot more push on the 50-50 on the water. And I really don't get too involved with any of that because I, 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 I'm not – saying I'm an elite fly fisher or anything. I think I'm just grumpy. I just, I'm <laughs> want to go by myself, be by myself, mainly or a couple people, you know? Right. So, uh, you know, I don't really uh, count the difference between the two. Cause really to me, it's everybody on the water, whether you're a kid, man, woman, whatever, or, just you know, just fishing. yeah, hundred percent. That's what I say. And so not 50, 50, a hundred percent of just anybody who wants to go, I guess, but don't ask me where I fish personally. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, you know, like I told you, I, I was, work, you know, and bless the guy that I worked with but and you know they didn't want some young punk who was 19 trying to you know I mean it took me like I had to work to get get in it now it's just with the availability of social media and all of that more it's just so much easier you can just like post like hey I want to you know learn how to fly fish and you could potentially have five followers that are like hey I know how to fly fish hey why don't you come you know so I think that's made it a little bit easier for uh, whether you're a, a female or a young boy who's never had any kind of fishing experience trying to find you know other kids that that fish or you know teenagers that potentially fish that's what I've seen too is a lot of teenagers uh, really um, bonding together and networking in the fly fishing world which has been cool all on social media and going out and doing stuff themselves at you know after school and I used to know these two two boys that would get off off school and they'd be on the bitter route every day uh, they'd be ditching school sometimes because awesome. I'd see them you know and so <laughs> yeah and so um, social media has definitely helped with all of that but um, it, and it's also made it more difficult you have you know in a way you have so many people who want to get out that um, some people are just not into helping people anymore get out that used to be. Um, so I guess maybe it's kind of a double-edged sword, but I think it's definitely more on the, the pro side of getting p kids out more now and uh, anybody too. I mean, adults, I've seen, you know, 50 year old ladies who have been like on Facebook commenting on something like, I want to learn how to fly fish. I want to learn mm -hmm. uh, United Women on the Fly all the time has consistently um you know uh, ladies who are older than 30 that are uh going on on there for the first time saying that they want to learn or they just moved to a new place too so um social media has just made it so so much easier for people to be able to be um you know vocal about hey i want to learn that you know they may not stick with it that's okay you know they may just you know want to get into it and try it for a little bit and maybe it's not their thing but there's just a lot more resources now for ever, you know, hunting, fishing, conservation, if you want to be, you know, in the recreation world and any aspect, there's just so many more resources, which is cool, you know, but it's also making yeah. places a lot busier. So 
you know, it's our duty as ambassadors of this great land that we're at, on, you know, and able to to recreate on is uh, to make sure that we're, you know, treating it properly, not necessarily, you know, uh, telling everybody about every place too, which is so hard because we all want to be influencers and we all want to, you know, do those things for a living is that'd be so cool, right? But at the same time, you know, it's just the impact that we, you know, leave as people increase, you know, in areas and increase recreation in areas is just important to watch and kind of just be mindful of. And it doesn't mean don't tell anybody. It just means, you know, be mindful of it and try to, uh, you know, uh, save it a little bit because mm-hmm. things are getting busy. And, um, you know, we had the numbers from 2018 to 2019 or 50.1 million people f- were fly fishing in the United States that year. Now that has had to have increased by quite a bit because when COVID happened, you had, you know, so many people who unfortunately were not able to work or um, fortunately for some people, (laughs) um, they were able to get out. I worked in a fly shop during it. It was so busy. So it was like people were supposed to be, you know, staying in, you know, and it was kind of when it was opening up a little bit, but fly fishing was one of those sports that really wasn't affected as much because yeah. you, you weren't around people, <laughs> you know, you were trying to do it by yourself. Um, and so I'm sure that 50.1 million number has definitely increased, of course, as the industry is increasing, it provides a ton of jobs, um, as it does increase. And so, um, how do we, you know, uh, save, you know, we talk about the environment and all of that. And how do we kind of, you know, make sure that we're taking care of that as well as, you know, providing for these folks whose livelihoods uh, are the fishing industry, whether it be fly shop owners or guides. Um, It's just, uh, it's really important and it's um, becoming more evident, I think, um, as you see organizations who are really stepping up to um, Trout Unlimited, obviously has always been a big um component of fishing uh, uh, conservation, but other ones, BHA. A lot of times people look at BHA as just, you know, a hunting advocate, but no, backcountry hunters and anglers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're in there. Yeah. Wyoming Wildlife (laughs) Federation has also done a lot of stuff um, as well for for fishing recently. Um, Mayfly Project, who's helping kids out who are in uh, foster homes or foster care. Uh, Indie Fly as well, too. So just a lot of really great organizations out there. Yeah, fly fishing seems to be growing exponentially. And right. I, th- I think COVID was like throwing gasoline on it. <laughs> yes. Because I mean, everywhere you went, I mean, every trailhead was packed with people because people were going nuts. They're like, what am I supposed to do with myself? It's like this you winter, know? like yeah, yeah, the shining, man. <laughs> Ooh, it's driving me nuts. <laughs> it's, it's, it's bad, right? Like, because you want to get outside. You want to mm-hmm. be in the sun. You want to get away. And fly fishing is a great way to do that. And there's so many species to catch and there's so right. many places to go. I mean, and if you don't have a job at the time and uh, you can maybe hop in the ride and, and cruise and check some of that out and even travel, you know, I mean, when I was in the fly shop in Montana during that COVID uh, kind of the end of COVID, I mean, they're, they were all over the state. I mean, all over different States, a lot from Washington, Idaho, uh, Wyoming, California. I mean, coming up to, to fish during that time. So uh, yeah, people were definitely traveling. Yeah, I was going up to the trailheads and the winds and like, I think there were two Wyoming plates. <laughs> and I think all right. the others were like Colorado, California, Wisconsin, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, you know, mm-hmm. and it's like, I can't blame them. I no, mean, yeah. Wyoming's vast and wide open. So they're like, shoot, man, I'm going to Wyoming. I've always wanted to do it. So now Boo, I'm going to do it. <laughs> don't. It's cold and windy. <laughs> the shining this winter for real <laughs> it is for real it's funny because i'm actually doing this harvard research thing for a class oh, and fancy yeah i know harvard. right i know it's weird um but there like if you look at the stats on wyoming there's a reason hardly anyone lives here and we're seeing it right now like with this much snow on the ground and super cold Ooh. and the wind and everything else it's like well yeah there's a reason that people aren't just like hey let's go to wyoming and live because <laughs> yeah. i've seen u-hauls leave in wyoming now because they're like man that was a lot worse than i thought it'd be you know? yeah we'll pick somewhere a little bit more mild so um the winters are rarely mild here too so yeah never. again it's not for the faint of heart but um you know that's why some of us are are here is because it is a little bit less populated but um but but it's even getting busy here. I mean, they project one of the, I mean, they had the, what the busiest summer last summer in, in Lander and uh, they project an even busier summer as well. And uh, you got to imagine they had a huge summer last summer yet Yellowstone national park dealt with their flooding, which 
uh, shut down a lot of tourism for um, areas. And that happens to be one the gateway from I-80 into Yellowstone National Park and Grand Teton. And so uh, I can only imagine that those folks that weren't able to go have that on their list this summer. And mm. so it's going to be, I think, I always say it's going to be extra busy because it is, it's always extra busy, right? But um, yeah, they're definitely forecasting from the uh, tourism <clears throat> industry that it's going to be uh, extra busy. Yeah, well, I'm ready for it. I mean, I, I figure it's going to happen right. more and more every year. I mean, it's been discovered, right? Like, Yeah, so how do you, yeah, and like I always think, like, how do you, you deal with that? Just stay positive and yeah. just, you know, which sometimes hard to do. Yeah, even Boyson, you know, I'll go there to fish for walleyes and I mean, there's a lot of boats every day. It doesn't matter. It used to just be Saturday, Sunday was packed, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Now it's all week, you know, and it's just like, well, that's just the way it is and just got to deal with it and it's okay. But, you know, there's implications to everything, right? Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, it's just something that's not going to stop. So there's just a lot of things that we can do, you know, just being good ambassadors of the land, whatever that might be to you. Um, and then, you know, trying to make sure we're practicing, you know, good ethics when we're fishing or hunting or just recreating in general too. And so um, I just think there's, you know, a, a lot of ways that we can improve um, while we are growing um, in a, as a population and it's not going to stop like you said. So we might as as well just uh, hold on tight because that's just how it is but there are things that we could just be proactive about just every single time we're out every single time we're out fly fishing every single time we're out hiking hunting you see something uh, trash you pick it up you never leave your trash behind uh, you try to leave as minimal of a footprint as we can you know maybe we don't bring in 20 people into a an area uh, even if you know, you're trying to commercialize or capitalize or make money. Uh, just thinking about some of these things. If you go to a place, you know, every year to fish, maybe you change it up a bit. And, you know, I try to do that. And I've been guilty of not at times, you know, and then I think about it and I'm like, you know what, I got to give those fish a rest, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, we kind of, as fly fishers, because it is a small world, we go on a little rotation clock then, you know, together. And so, or, you know, not necessarily hitting all the spots we've hit the year pure previous but somebody else is you know that we know because they know you know we're friends they know where i was or I, I know where they were and maybe we're switching off you know like i'm going there this year and they're going to the other place so uh hard to do you know we're not in like a database where we can no. sit there and say that but that's just one way that it's just kind of like it's just being conscious of of how that works yeah absolutely well let's talk about tactics a little bit because fly fishing has its tactics you don't just use the same fly every day so what does it look like throughout the season? So start with like the winter season, because that's what we're in. What would you use? And then moving on to spring, summer, and fall. Yeah, well, um, obviously uh, for winter, you're mainly using streamers and nymphs. Um, these are going to be, you know, it just depends on where you're, at, where you're at. So I guess I won't dive into all of that. So real basics, winter, streamer, and nymphs. Spring, you're doing your, you know, nymphs and emergers and even maybe a, a few dries. And there are a lot of places you could fish dry as 365, to be honest. So, and uh, we happen to, there's areas here that, that you can do that if it's not so cold. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, you know, in really in that May, June time, you start having some really big hatches, whether it be, you know, salmon fly hatches or whatnot. And um, in the summer, you know, you can use all of it. It is an absolute smorgasbord of, you know, whether it's hoppers or, you know, a big, you know, uh, chubby or dries or whatever it may be. And then a dropper or <clears throat> just doing nymphs. It's all productive streamers, all of the above. Obviously, most people who fly fish in the summer, um, uh, really want to fish dries. That's the appeal yeah. of it. You have a fairly small window um, in most areas for real dry fly action. Smaller window too for some hopper seasons in some areas too. And then um, in the fall, you know, I get really into uh, spruce moths and caddis, you know, too as well. So, um, and again, as that's as a dry or, or nymph or, or, you know, a merger. Um, and then back to the winter months of, you know, getting back down, down and dirty and doing some uh, nymphing and uh, some uh, streamers. I try to stay away from fishing eggs. I don't do it a ton. I don't like it. Um, in Alaska, it's the only thing you can do really in many places um, anyways. And so not the biggest fan of that, but it is productive as well. And um, I've known people who do that all year long. So <laughs> it's like, um, 
So, you know, I don't really know uh, too much science behind that, but I do know folks that just uh, are pegging eggs or whatever it's called all year long, even on the fly on the fly rod. So um, it sounds like that would be useful in some areas uh, mm-hmm. during certain seasons or maybe all of them as well. Um, another important thing about all of this and more is the gear that you have. Now, you don't necessarily need to go out and spend a bunch of money to be a good fly fisher. And I always try to tell people that, like, I started with a little... Like, uh, what was it? <laughs> it was from like Bass Pro Shops or something. It was like uh, 30 bucks <clears throat> and an Orvis reel that was gifted to me. And so uh, it, it, w- it wasn't like I had, and I had that for a very, very, very long time using it. And it was, and just, it works. Yeah. And it works. <laughs> and I caught a lot of fish on it, but there is something to be said with learning about line weights and reels and what things are for. Um, if, you know, you have a sinking line on your, your, real and you're trying to get a dry fly well it's not going to work right and so there's just things of you know being in the know about stuff and you know going to a fly shop and inquiring and you know they can check if you got a reel at a garage sale for example and you have no idea about it take it to somebody who might you know because there's also sometimes a little code on the line they can you know figure out what it is or they can tell or you know they can put it in water, which you could also do and see if it floats or sinks. But, mm-hmm. um, and so just really, uh, you know, utilizing some of, um, those tools too. So resources with folks that are in, you know, fishing organizations, fly shops or friends, and then really just kind of knowing, you know, a little bit about gear. You don't have to spend a bunch, but like some lower, you know, like echo and TFO are kind of, you know, small, you know, more affordable, um, brands that, put out really great rods. Lefty was, uh, you know, like the face of, uh, TFO lefty cray. So it's like, you know, and you can't, uh, you can't beat that and they're really affordable. Um, and echoes are as well. And I've had both and utilized both at times and I have pretty much all TFO rods and, um, I absolutely love them and they're affordable. And so, uh, maybe not necessarily, going and getting that $30 rod, but looking at kind of what's available Mm -hmm. out there. And then, you know, you have your higher end Sage and Orvis and Scott and all of those as well. And so um, once you get into it too, I say recommend getting, you know, a nicer rod, but sometimes people want to go out and just spin the whole hoopla on it. And that's okay. Um, Sometimes a really, really good rod can make you a better fly fisher. (laughs) It's Mm -hmm. me at times, you know, I've picked up, different rods where I've just been like, I mean, for example, the Sage R8, which I'm trying to get is just like a dream. And I swear I'm like, I can cast a dry fly like a half a mile if I can, you know, I mean, it's just, it was just whizzing, you know, mm-hmm. um, the Sage X, another, uh, a great one as well. And so some of them really do are built. They're getting built so much better too, as time goes on, but they're built so well too, are built for just certain things, you know, they're, slow action, you know, medium action, fast action. And what does that mean? And, you know, what can you fish best with those? But um, if you have the right one at the right time, that is going to help you be a better caster, a better fly fisher. Um, But you don't necessarily need that to start fly fishing or fly fishing at all. I mean, people fly fish with you stuff that they've had for a long time and have great luck. Yeah. And if you're taking a kid, get them something affordable, just get them to learn the the mechanics of it because the mechanics are really important right yeah that's really where it, <laughs> the rhythm you know and that's really tough with fly fishing but it's getting so popular but not everybody has what it takes you know or doesn't like the whole concept of fly fishing but if you can just get the rhythm down if you can just get the whole concept down of how you know the 10 and 2 and how where you know how the different rods you know if you have something with fast fast action you may be stopping that rod at a different place than a different rod yeah your timing will change for yeah sure. yeah and once you get that down and again if you get that down you have the right good rod at the right time too i mean that combination can really elevate folks but it all, all takes time i've known folks that have fly fished for 40 50 years who just learn stuff all the time mm-hmm. and I mean, I, I haven't fly fished much for two months and I feel like I'm like starting back <laughs> as a child. Like I know it's like riding a bike, but I feel like it's just so weird to me. It's like if I don't do it every single day and I haven't or every you know week, it's like I just forget things. I forget how to tie some of the knots and it takes me like some, you know, a bit of 
stuff to get back to it, you know, but it's just how, how difficult it can be at times and what all goes into it that it's why it takes sometimes a really long time to master it. And sometimes I never know if you really do master fly fishing. Yeah. And I, I wonder about fishing in general. I mean, I've seen guys that I would consider, you know, the upper echelon that can really get it done in gals too, where it's just like, holy cow. I mean, they're, they're dialed in, Mm -hmm. but I don't know that you're ever like a complete master, you know? And I think that's part of what brings you back to fishing. The fish is the master. (laughs) You're like, I'm going to get better this time, you know? Right. Right. You start challenging yourself to catch the fish the way you want to catch them and different challenges to keep it interesting. But yeah, it's, it's certainly a challenge and it's fun though. Can I drink my coffee? Well, I suppose, you know, (laughs) I was thinking about this before we uh, came on, but one of the things that gets confusing is people, they're like, well, what weight rod do I need? You know, and that's important because if you're, if you're chasing muskies, you're not going to have the same rod as you are chasing brook trout. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Any kind of mountain, uh, high mountain fishing, you know, you could use a three or a four weight, even a five weight. Um, if that's what you have, the five weight is the most versatile fly it's rod. Kinda in the middle. It's kind of like right the there. Yeah. It's the medium it, it, and really it's the lowest that you want for anything out of the mountains. Really. I mean, it's like, that's the, you know, the five, you're not going to, you know, fish, uh, a river, a big river with a, a four weight. I mean, you could, but, and some people do, but, um, yeah, the five weights pretty much like the go-to fly rod. If you're getting into it and you're looking for a fly rod, yeah, the five weights, nine foot five weights, what's going to be recommended to you. Um, six weight is what you would like probably use streamers for getting a little bit bigger fish to bigger trout use six or seven weight for streamers going up to pike or musky eight or nine weight right and there. Salmon. Yeah. And salmon. And then, um, and I don't, uh, I use an eight weight when I was trying to fly fish for walleye. So I assume it would probably be around an eight weight for walleye. Mm-hmm. Um, and then for, um, even in up in Alaska using an eight weight, seven, eight or nine just depends uh, on what you're fishing there with a fly rod. Um, and then, uh, um, salt water is, you know, uh, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, you Broom know, stick. yeah. When you're getting <laughs> into some, uh, big daddy fish there. So, yeah. uh, so yeah, that's kind of how that progresses too. Um, I don't know much on like, um, the spay, I'm getting more into spay. I can spay cast and spay fish, but I'm learning how all that works because it's a little bit different of a ratio on weights. Um, and then I don't know much about Euro nymphing and, you know, that. And then ten cars are a little bit different too, as far as I know. But um, I know some folks that use those religiously and and love them too. So um, there's different styles of rods, different weights. And then like in spay rods, the weights are a little bit different of a ratio by two. So yeah, if you're fishing in Wyoming and you're fishing trout streams, most likely you're doing the nine foot five weight. Yeah. Five or six. Yeah. This depends. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And what's important to have in the kit because everybody's got their little fly box, you know, or multiple like me where I've got, because I tie them too. So I've got all this stuff, but like what what's the best thing to always have on hand when you're going fly fishing what are some of the go-to's um well like a little kit you would want to have are some nippers obviously with you um so some nippers uh some vice grips if if you can as well because you you know it's nice to be able to use those to get the hooks out of the fish properly or easily too and be Mm -hmm. getting back to fishing quickly um for flies i like to put kind of just a little bit of everything in a box even if i do not think like if i sit there and say to myself don't ever say this to yourself like oh it's not going to have any dry flies today because there will be dry fly action so my recommendation is just pack a little bit of everything um and then you know just kind of you know make sure obviously you want to pack for what the area is you know you're not going to bring a a salmon fly at you know in september potentially you know i mean because they're going to be most likely gone but um for you know just kind of packing a little bit of everything for that area that you're in and you obviously would know what area that is but you know a few dry flies few few nymphs you know mergers get yourself a couple streamers um always have extra tippet that's just the worst um you don't want to be somewhere and run out of the ability to actually have any line you know so sometimes you're you know using up line if things are you know getting stuck or whatnot things so, happen yeah 
yeah. Right? Yeah, things happen. Okay. So I've seen people be really, um, you know, creative, though, like when they've been up in the mountains or whatnot, trying to just find things that could mimic or build or, um, you know, add to a fly or something, you know, that they may have found that's just mm -hmm. an interesting, you know, sometimes they're, it's trash that shouldn't be there, <laughs> but, um, you know, they're being creative in that way. So yeah, just having a little bit of everything, um, you know, and just making sure you're not stuck without the essentials, you know, some of, you know, the tippet, you know, dry flies, even if you don't think it is because, you know, that's the worst is to be and be like, oh man, I wish I, you know, I wish I had one, you know, especially if you're far away from your, your truck or, you know, the main, main stash, mm -hmm. because we know everybody has a big main stash and then you go from the main stash to the smaller stash too, as well. I always pack lipstick with me. That's always one of my essentials. <laughs> um, if I'm floating down the river, I want there to be some bright thing that flashes to folks now so that they know that I'm, I'm getting a suck down the river, but no. And also just to differentiate myself between the men on the river too. And at least my friends know like, Oh, there's Shireen. She's down there with the bright lipstick. So uh, I also always have, you know, um, like some sort of uh, glove with me too, even though, you know, you don't want to be picking up the fish a lot with your gloves too, but you just never know when in your hands are in the water and stuff. Like as you get older and stuff, it gets rough on the hands. And so, yeah. Yeah, you know, trying to take care of them and be as kind as you can to the hands I've learned in fly fishing has been, I've had them in the sun so much. I look like, you know, it's just like crazy old lady hands <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's just vice versa too. Just like yeah. consistently getting cold. Like I don't know how many times I've dunked my hands in and then just not warming up, just keeping fishing, you know, in the winter or, you know, whether even, even ice fishing, you know, dunking your hands or something happened and trying to get the fish out yeah. and your hands are I think just take a beating in fishing in general and really they in do. fly fishing. Well, and in Wyoming with the cold and the wind, it just sucks the moisture out of your hands. Like that last trip I went on, I caught nine fish, released them all. My hands were killing me the next day. I mean, they were super dry, cracked. Right? It was just yeah. like, holy crap. And it was painful. Like, Picking the fish up and get them unhooked and doing all the mm -hmm. stuff. I'm like, oh gosh, I can't wait to get my gloves back on because it's freezing. Right, right, yeah. And so having gloves is always just even if you're like in the summertime and but you're so going UV into the gloves. back country, yeah, UV gloves for, for sure. But even can get chilly if you're, um, you know, going into the back country. So it's like you know, as I get older, I'm like, man, I just want to keep my joints and my bones mm -hmm. warm while I'm out doing these things because it can uh, be rough on on the body. But uh, yeah. you know, no pain, no gain. Yeah. Especially in fly fishing. And the only thing I would add to this is make sure you have at least two of each fly that you want to take. Oh yeah. Because course. guaranteed you're going to put one in a tree or you're going to break one off or something like that. And then you're going to be like, crap, that's what they were hitting today. And you don't have another one. So always have a spare. Yeah. Yeah. Or some variations of one fly that, you know, would, you know, fool them one way or the other too, but you're right. Usually that's how it works too. It's like, you know, you only have a couple of, and that's how it is on the water many times, you know, it's like, that's my last fly of that. And it's just like, no, the tree mm -hmm. monster. <laughs> wow, those trees will kill you. Yeah. So. And, and that's hard because I mean, you, you're flipping it back and if you think you got more room than you do and then you hook a tree, it's over. Or you're like me and you climb in the tree and go get it. Yeah. I mean, but. there are, I, I don't think anybody I fish with doesn't go back and like, it's like <laughs> we're getting that fly. Like it's especially not, if it's working. Yeah. Especially if it's, you know, you're with your guide buddies too. It's like, they don't have the, the inventory to be losing flies. They've got mm -hmm. clients and stuff too, and they've been tying. So it's like, you don't want to be uh, losing their flies anyways, because they need them. And you know, it's just not just one fly and that's what i always say to myself it's like oh it's just one no it's not just one fly in the end of your life of fly fishing it's <laughs> so many flies that are lost in mm -hmm. trees and so for the environment too it's really important for us to go and climb the trees like you do or get the <laughs> flies out <clears throat> so we're not having these <clears throat> i mean they're bad for birds and all kinds of stuff oh yeah having them up there i know that you know it's like bad turn there on it but it is uh, really so if you do get instead of just breaking it off if you can go back and retrieve that fly you know even if you take a break from fishing for 10 minutes even if a boat's gonna pass you oh you're gonna miss that first you're gonna miss running the street run first uh go back and get that fly if you can because if everybody left their flies you know it just it does pile up quickly we've 
I've seen that where you've yeah. gone into and it's just like a whole nest of them. I mean, you get some good flies out though. If you yeah. can get some prime pickings. Sometimes. Like, you get like 50 bucks worth sometimes. Even on like walleye lakes and stuff, you'll go by where people have trolled and they've lost a whole bunch of stuff in the brush and rocks and you make, you can make a killing, you know, it's like, Hey, check it out. I just got exactly. five new crankbaits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Exactly. Yeah. But um, if you can get those out, do try to do that. But uh, roll casting is a great way to try to, you know, limit, limit a little bit of that too. So if you can get roll casting down, it's definitely been, been helpful. So here's your challenge because most people are going to listen to the audio of this. And so describe a roll cast. Yeah, I mean, the people watching on YouTube can watch, but I want you to describe how a roll cast actually works. Well, a roll cast would be like where you're going to pull up your line mm -hmm. and pull it towards you, and then you're going to flick it out. So you're going to kind of get that bobber off, but you don't want too much out. If you have too much line out, it's not going to go anywhere. Right. So, you know, there's a happy medium there. So, you know, you're not going to have, you're going to have line out, but you're going to have, you know, pinch it a little bit here, bring up that thing and then just flick, your flick wrist. it and then just flick it. Flick at a wrist. Flick at a wrist. <laughs> I taught Donnell Rawlings how to fly fish. He's Ashley Larry from uh, Dave Chappelle show. Oh, really? Yeah. And he was always nice. saying flick of the wrist. And I was like, no, no, actually in actual fly fishing, you don't want to flick your wrist. Like you want to keep your wrist straight, but in, yeah. in the roll cast, it seems like you would kind of flick of the wrist, but you're just mainly turning it over. Kind of turn your hand over as yeah, you so, flip the line. Yeah, you just but that is up. a super efficient way to fly fish too, because a lot of times on skinny water, you don't need that much line anyway. And all you're trying to do is just get it back up in the drift and drift it back through. Do you know right? how hard that was trying to do something without a fly rod in my hands? I'm pretty sure I didn't do that at all accurate yet. I do know how to roll cast I'm sure quite well, just fine. but I'm just, just like, fine. what you want me to show? I'm like, there's nothing here, but well, yeah, that's, no. That's one of the fun things about podcasting. It's like, like how am I hey. going to describe this to I was somebody, like, you know? Spay cast? No, but yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> well, painting a picture with your words is my favorite yeah, thing. Uh, I did a terrible job there, but for roll casting yeah. for, you know, the, just the audio, you know, you're just pulling up your rod and your indicator if you're using obviously you know you probably be either your dry fly or nymphs and uh or a you know big chubby and a dropper but you just kind of bring that up and then you know f flick it over yeah. it was terrible <laughs> you did fine <laughs> like, oh the roll casting is a big deal it took yeah. me a long time it took me a long time to learn i don't know why i i'm actually really uncoordinated by the way i'm the world's worst fly fisher <laughs> and, but i do it probably more than most folks. Um, and that's the funny part is no balance. Uh, no, well, I can, I can dance, I can move and I can groove a little bit. So I got a little finesse. Uh, my one of my nicknames is Shereen the dancing queen, but, um, uh, yeah, real kind of uncoordinated, um, you know, but you're still fly fishing. Uh, so. Yes. And it takes work and it takes practice mm -hmm. and it's not easy. And it's not something you just get, you know, to go out a few times and be like, Oh, I'm awesome at this. Like it takes work. You're going to go through frustrations. Mm -hmm. You're going to be upset. I think I, I could say I still cry so many times <laughs> or not, or almost cry on the river so many times when I'm mad at myself. I mean, just fishing in Mexico, I was, so frustrated because I couldn't chuck this nine weight rod and it was a good rod with a good reel. Didn't have the best line on it. That's okay. Um, but I should have been better at it than I was, but I was just not used to, and I hadn't, that's the other thing is I went on this trip and I didn't throw a big rod before I went because I don't own a big saltwater rod. And so, uh, that's the other thing is if you're going to go on these trips, you want to practice ahead of time. <laughs> but I was so frustrated because I just couldn't get, I finally jumped a tarpon and I hooked four of them and jumped one, but it's like, it took me the whole entire day and I was fishing the whole time. Like there was no trading off because my friend was gear fishing off the side of the boat, which was awesome. I was like, sweet, I got to fish the whole time. And it's also a lot of work because you're up on the bow of the yeah. boat the whole day. But um, yeah, it was frustrating. So I think every time I go out, I get frustrated from time to time you know, still it's like, I just, yeah. you know, there's so much to learn and so much to remember. And you're trying to trick these very smart fish at times. And, you know, you're trying to mimic this fly to look just like the, all the other natural ones. And sometimes you're trying to mimic it in a, a hatch of thousands of other bugs that are real that yeah. don't need to fake it. <laughs> yeah. It's like you're competing with all this other forage and that can be really tough. It is. And it's super like, if you're a competitive person, you are competing against nature and it is 
nature is metal, man. They're not messing around and they don't care about you and they're out there doing their thing. And, you know, you need to, you know, blend in and you need to camouflage yourself or your fly as, you know, one of them. And it's like mm. this whole CIA thing that you <laughs> infiltrate the people, you know, no, but it is, it's just so much fun. It is so competitive with that aspect is you don't have to compete against humans. You're competing against, you know, the best of the best out there in nature and, you know, b bugs insects you know and right all of that and more so fly fishing is an interesting world because there's it used to be primarily it was like it was a guy's thing and the rich guy right like right the elite guy the you know and that's changed a lot which is good um but i know that for me when i was younger that was a big turnoff is that you know you had the people on the river that right. stuck their nose up at you. Totally. I'm out there using some really cheap fly rod that I got, you know, just doing the best I can. And oh, man. Oh, snubbing you. Oh, oh for yeah. sure. It happens all the time. But I did just read some numbers where it's definitely, I think it's only like 10% of fly fishers have a salary over $100,000 or more. So that's it's not, changed. you yeah. know, it's not the case so much anymore. But yeah, I think that's why fly fishers, you know, I've ran into, I've had issues with folks that have thought I was an elite fly fisher or a snob. And, you know, I just, I, I, you know, I have my feelings about gear fishing and, you know, you know, my thoughts, you know, but in all honesties, I just think I'm grumpy. I don't, I'm not an elite fly. I'm just like trying to be out there by myself. I'm not trying to be snobby or rude. I'm just trying to enjoy my peace and quiet, you know, and do my yeah. thing. And so I think sometimes that's taken as, you know, uh, people being, you know, snobby or rude and fly fishing when really they're just trying to be away from people and serene and disconnect and they don't necessarily want to take you or want you to you know um be right next to them you know mm -hmm. which is happening more often you know as we're uh dealing with just more people out on the water so uh yeah i think a lot of people like in gear uh, that's just like people always talk about gear fishers versus, versus fly fishers you know and i think you know in the same we're all trying to get out there and, and fish and a lot of times gear fishers want to fish by themselves too so like you know it's yes, the do. same concept. You know, it's not <laughs> being elite. It's just being grumpy, curmudgeons. I think all fishermen are a little grumpy. Yes. And for, re for good okay? reason, for good reason. I mean, it's, it is competitive. I want that spot. You're in my spot or, you know, my spot. No one really owns it, but, right. you know, or I'm working an area and you just cut me off. Right. Like in my boat, that yeah. makes me mad because mm -hmm. I'm like, hey, I was just working this shoreline going this way and you just like rushed up and cut me off like, mm, you know. Trolling motor fight. <laughs> oh, no. I just put on the musky bait and <laughs> hit him upside the head <laughs> with the bait caster. Concussed by a musky bait. <laughs> <laughs> no. In all seriousness, though, I think we all just want the same thing. We want to be outside. We want to enjoy it. And we have different ways of doing it and that's okay at the end of the day, you know, and that's, I think that's another hard thing. Cause I think that, uh, there is a perception that, you know, from both ends, right? Like what well, my way is better than your way. Well, maybe that day it is. And maybe the next day it right. isn't. Yeah, there are times, it yeah. doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Why are you out there? You're out there to enjoy the outdoors, to catch the fish, the, the joy of the pursuit is why you're there. Yeah. Now, if I'm fly fishing and some gear fishers come over and they're like throwing their treble hooks in front of me, then yeah, there's an issue, you know. And if you're fishing with treble hooks, you should really be keeping fish. I mean, essentially. So that's the other thing. And I see that, you know, consistently not happening. And so, um, you know, educating folks too about that is another thing too. It's like, it's, you know, a great way to harvest fish. If you're going to be keeping fish, you know, gear rod, treble hook all day, you know, like that's a great way to, and just, you're using that treble hook, rip them up a little bit. That's okay. You're keeping them. So, who, you know, it doesn't matter and it might be pretty productive for you. Um, so I think some education on those things too, but yeah, like you said, everybody's just trying to get out and a lot of people just want to be out by themselves too, whether they're, <laughs> you know, gear fishing or fly fishing. And yeah. so I think it's just kind of comes with, with, with the territory, like you said, and I, I own that. I don't ever want to, you know, hide the fact that, you know, I, I want to be out there alone. I don't want everybody out there. So I don't, you know, promote it as much as some other people might, but as far as like teaching people and on and so forth, but, um, I want to do my part to protect the fish. So I'm on the other side of things, you know, got, you know, a lot of people in the industry that are promoting people to get on the water and I'm promoting how do we protect the fish and how do we increase the number of fish and what does that look like in, you know, the next 10 years. And so I'm hoping to get more involved with just that behind the scenes kind of thing with, you know, how, how does that affect 
the fish because they're wildlife too. I think a lot of times they get forgotten. They do. I'm glad to yeah. see a lot of organizations that are stepping up and trying to do more things for fly fishing that have been, you know, routinely involved with hunting. And um, it's good to see that as well. And so uh, I think oftentimes though, they're, they're forgot as an animal. They have feelings too. <laughs> they do. They flail around. You want to know why? It's because they're freaked out that we're taking them out <laughs> of the water, man. <laughs> like you guys, we got to understand that, you know, sometimes we talk about, not harassing, you know, wildlife and game and fish is so good about that, you know, and making sure people aren't, but what about harassing the fish? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we got to make yeah. sure that we're taking care of them too. And, um, you know, cause in the long term, you know, we want to make sure that it's sustainable for future generations. I think we all agree on that. The only way to do yeah. that is to be mindful and conscious. Like I had mentioned earlier in the podcast about how, you know, whatever that means to you, what does that mean to you? And just try to do it every time you're out. Yeah. There's a, big scientific component to that too of you know i think it gets overlooked is that when you hook a fish and you drag it up on the bank or into a net or whatever it's stressing that fish out like mm -hmm. it's it's yeah. hard on them mm -hmm. and trout are extremely delicate they just are i mean you can catch a walleye they're pretty tough catfish are extremely tough carp are extremely tough but a rainbow trout is not and a cutthroat trout is not so how you handle them is going to be different. And, and to your point, like treble hooks, yeah, they're hard on trout, you know, and there's a lot of times that you catch something with a treble, you're going to have to keep it mm -hmm. or yeah. it's going to go out there and die. Yeah. But I, I do think that that's important to look at what does that fishery have for, you know, carrying capacity? How many fish need to be harvested? Cause there's a lot of places that if you didn't harvest fish, it would get out of control. Especially brown trout. I mean, they get yeah. super, yeah, they, super invasive in a way. So, just, And they look funny, yeah. like, because they get stunted and their heads get big <laughs> and their bodies get small. Like, there, there is definitely, an, you know, it's a balance. And I talked with Doug Stangy. We had him on a couple episodes ago just talking about selective harvest. Like, it is important to harvest. Well, that's why we, you know, look to folks to manage some of these areas and, uh, you know, waterways and, mm -hmm. you know, yep. the fish as well as exactly is because, you know, they do this research and they're out there and they're able to find some of this data that does really, you know, point to the fact that we do need to, you know, harvest certain number or whatnot. And you find that in a lot of places where they're like, you know, it's a kill on brown trout. You know, if you get any brown trout, you know, you need to you know harvest them. So uh, I don't, you know, I don't remember. I can't remember the last time I fly. I'm trying to think if I, in the saltwater, was I fly fishing? I think I, I don't know if I had, no, neither one of those. I was gear fishing, <laughs> surprise, surprise, uh, and uh, ha ate those afterwards. But um, I don't remember, you know, keeping too much, maybe a brook trout or two in the high mountains for, you know, those cooking for camping but mm -hmm. um you know it's been a long time if i have kept anything so always kind of promoting zero limit which is catch and release which means you know just putting it back if, if you can and if you know it's the right thing to do you know i mean if for some reason it's not going to live you know and you can eat it or you know utilize don't it then waste it. don't waste it yeah definitely mm -hmm. do but you know the good thing about nature is that if that fish does you know there's chances that a bird or something will Something end really up picking it. picking it up, which <laughs> then it goes you know back. So that's not a terrible thing either. But um, but yeah, the the catch and release is kind of my jam for sure. Um, more fish for uh, the people I don't want on the water. But hey, <laughs> <laughs> um, I say that jokingly. Yeah, and it's it's kind of interesting because you have the bell curve. You have the people that keep everything, and then the people who don't keep anything. And then I'm right here in the middle of that bell curve. Yeah, it's depending on where I'm at, like. If I'm fishing the river, you know that I like to fish. Mm -hmm. I'm putting those fish back. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's yeah. a blue ribbon. Yeah. And you fishery. catch walleye that you eat and stuff, and right? And they're I delicious. Yeah. Like, I mean, there's just, there's a lot of fish that it really is great. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I don't, you know, obviously, you know, say no catching or no keeping fish, but um, just for me personally, I have them. But yeah, walleye are just so oh, good. Man. And s smoked lake trout, smoked perch. trout in general can be really yeah. good. Perch are good. Love perch. The good old perch fries crappie yeah crappie yep yeah. so there are a lot of tasty scrumptious fish out there <laughs> yeah. but again it's all in moderation right yeah because definitely you don't want to crush that fishery by 
over harvest or yeah that's happened in so many historical instances you know whether it be with fish or or wildlife where they've just come in and just you know blasted out an area um you know those old duck guns they used to have back in the day they would just put them (laughs) on the boats and the thing would like blast a trajectory a massive trajectory of bullets and just take out the whole like flock that was flying and they ban those um and actually there's a pawn shop that has one but i mean there's just <laughs> things like that that they used to do where we're you know we've just advanced as a society i mean we put a man on the moon so we can mm. <laughs> we can uh, tend to tend to our things a little better than than in yeah. the past and so that's what you're seeing happening and it's great because uh, it'll ensure that we have this for your kids you know yep uh, you know, other people's, you know, kids and families and future generations. And so it's just key that we all play our role too. And so there's so much with fly fishing though. It's getting so busy. You got every kind of trip in the world coming out for fly fishing. So if you're into that kind of thing, and then there's all kinds of groups and organizations, you know, locking into the right one is always key to one that's not necessarily utilizing, um, you know, social media to, you know, get famous or only have the best looking people on them, you know, ones that are really inclusive and uh, trying to give back for conservation as well. And so things like that too, because there's so many of them just do a little research. There's so many that I don't, don't even know about that are just little groups in certain areas uh, that are fly fishing groups or hunting groups or whatnot like that. So um, get involved and, you know, uh, you know, follow suit with the conservation and, or lead the charge one of the two. And um, because that's the only way we're going to make this thing work too, because there's no stopping the amount of people, the population's increasing. There's no stopping that every year. There's more fly fishers and hunters. So as we look at the, you know, futures of both of those, you know, how can we, can we help that? And that's one way. Yeah, I absolutely agree. So for the listeners, if they want to learn more, you know, follow you, whatever with County 10 and all the other things that you do, how do they do that? Uh, well, you can find me on Instagram, Shireen, which is C-H-A-R-E-N-E, the adventure queen, or just county10.com. Um, you can click on podcasts or radio and find all of our stuff there. Um, anything you see that uh, says the County 10 podcast, uh, I'm featured on that normally. Um, and many other great folks like, you know, yourselves and, and whatnot have been on. But um, yeah, all kinds of great conservation stuff with uh, Wyoming Game and Fish too, uh, Wyoming Wildlife Federation as well, the Muley Fanatic Foundation, um, which we're going to actually be uh, hanging hopefully with Jim Shockey. Hopefully. <laughs> Cross your fingers. Uh, and so that's going to be cool too. So yeah, my job definitely gets me involved in a lot of different aspects of uh, uh, hunting and fishing and conservation, or at least I've uh, integrated myself in there somehow. But um, yeah, you can find all of that county10.com or Facebook. You can find me there. You, Patrick will post this link, I'm sure. And yep, yeah, absolutely. so, um, but uh, yeah, just as far as anything goes is just, you know, uh, taking care of, uh, you know, the waterways, the fish, and then I always have to put in a really important plug for the landowners. Thank you so much to all the landowners out there that do allow folks to utilize their property, whether it be for hunting or fishing. And please, let's all respect that. And let's all repair those relationships that one, once may have been um, in disarray. And so uh, it, they're key to everything as we move forward with conservation is so many of these ma- big landowners and things of that nature. And you're finding more corporations that are coming in and, and buying up land. And so if we can really rally together with the folks that are, uh, lo- you know, local landowners uh, and, and private landowners and really uh, start opening up some of those avenues, uh, we're going to need that as the population is increasing. And we only have a certain amount of land and a certain amount of, you know, hunting and fishing areas. And so we're going to need those relationships. And again, just thank you to all the landowners in the country who allow people to come out and hunt and yourself included and just, you know, allowing folks to, to maybe harvest their first animal, like the lady who let me come on her property. Mm -hmm. Um, It changed my life. And so I just thank you so much to all of them and let's continue to, you know, make this thing happen together. And, you know, it can't happen. One can't happen without the other, you know, we can't be, you know, always boasting, wanting public lands, public lands, public access, public access, and completely, you know, um, you know, disrespecting or, not shedding a light on how important the landowner is and yeah. what we can do. So, um, you know, that's a whole nother conversation that hopefully I know you have a gr- lot of great guests that, um, you know, have feelings on that and stuff too, that I've heard about. So it's, yeah. uh, it's cool. a big deal. Yeah. 
because we're all in this together and yes. it's good to respect each other and take care of, like I always say to everybody, being a good steward of what we have, whether it's your land or public land, doesn't matter. Be a good steward. Yes. And thank so. you for what you guys do. You and David always promoting conservation, always being good stewards, always uh, having fun with the outdoors and uh, just really respecting, you know, what we all uh, love and enjoy. And, you know, your your passion project here has really grown and it's been great to see you guys started in the, the County 10 mm -hmm. uh, Porter's podcast area. And now, um, you know, you're going to be teaching, uh, helping teach a podcast workshop. <laughs> and I'm saying that now because that's, that's locking crazy. you in. <laughs> yeah, you're like, you're doing it. <laughs> so uh, again, yeah, congratulations. And uh, thanks for all that you guys do as well. Yeah, thank you very much for coming on the show. And yeah, we'll we'll come back again with another fun podcast, I'm sure, down the road. Yeah, I got to go either kill something or fish <laughs> somewhere really, really cool where uh, I can get invited back. Um, but I uh, hope to have you guys on as well. And, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, have a cool podcast coming up. I'm not sure if that'll be in the works or not, but be watching. Yeah, hopefully we'll get her done. Yeah, let's do it. All right, cool. Well, thanks again for coming on. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks again for listening to the Radcast Outdoors podcast. We hope that you've enjoyed the show. If so, please go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to this podcast and subscribe, share, and give us a five-star rating, which really helps other people find the show. You can find all of our shows, recipes, giveaways, videos, and much more at radcastoutdoors.com. While you're there, please help support the show by purchasing a Radcast Outdoors shirt, or hat. Please don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. We also have a Radcast community on Facebook called Radcast Nation, and we'd love for you to join in the conversation there. And of course, please help support our sponsors who make this show possible. Thank you again to PK Lures, Bow Spider, and High Mountain Seasonings. Until next time, get out there and enjoy the outdoors.